today we've got an exciting colloquium with uh, folks from a variety of different labs as well as different departments, uh, all focusing on different aspects of digital fabrication research. Uh, without further ado, let's start with our first speaker, Liang He, um, who's in his last year of his PhD. All right, thank you, Megan. Um, yeah, so I'm a first a final year PhD at here, here in the de department. Uh, today I'm going to talk about my recent work, model like a design tool for prototyping physical computing devices using conductive 3D printing. Uh, this work was done uh, when I was interning at uh, HP Research Labs last year, and this work will be published in the next month in uh, the Journal of Imut. Okay, first of all, I want to uh, talk about uh, physical computing. So physical computing is about building interactive physical systems by the use of software and hardware that can sense and respond to the analog world. Uh, there are two main uh, parts in this description, uh, which is about the form, physical form and also how the physical form can react to the physical world, like the human interactions. To do so, we usually have two separate workflows here. One is to create a 3D model physical form and the second one is to create a functional circuit. And to do so, um, these two workflows are usually independent from each other. And uh, pro for example, in a product team, probably will, uh, there are different people doing on these two different workflows, like mechanical designers can create the phys physical form design, and the electrical engineers may work on the prototyping of the circuits. And once the 3D models are created, we probably use some fabrication techniques to create the physical objects, like 3D printing. And then, uh, once the physical object is created, then we need to embed the circuits inside the 3D models. Uh, it, it involves two additional processes. processes. One is electrical uh, deployment, uh, components assembly, and the other one is electrical wiring. Let's see a concrete user scenario here. Uh, let's say there's a, a maker called John, and he wants to create a, a rat with two LED embedded as eyes. And first of all, he might need to prototype the very simple basic uh, LED circuit on a breadboard. And then he might need to create the 3D model in a CAD tool. Once these two parts are done, they, they want, uh, he might need to uh, 3D print the rat model, and then uh, figure out how to embed this uh, electronics inside the model. Uh, in this case, he might need to drill the holes for the eyes and then embed the LED. But sometimes he might need to go back to the CAD tool and reprint the model. So in that case, we can see there's an a iterative uh, process and where the people need to uh, update the models of very often and also uh, adding some electronics and also the crafting after the 3D print objects is done. So in the fabri fabrication research community, uh, people have explored a variety of ways to in integrate the circuits and the computation into 3D printed objects for interactions. For example, here we can see some people are using computing devices like the handheld devices, and the, the, the other people are using the sensors like an air pressure sensor to in, uh, detect the user input. And th there's another uh, research thread which is uh, talking about uh, manually create the uh, circuits on the 3D printed objects. Like they can use the highly uh, conductive copper tapes for a chases, for a chase, and also uh, in interject, interject, interjecting some conductive materials on the 3D printed subject. Uh, even they can use some very unconventional material like the fiber, carbon fiber in the 3D printing process. Uh, lastly, people are also creating, uh, developing design tools for, P, uh, for, for end user to incorporate the electronics and also the 3D printed forms. In the meanwhile, we have seen one of the most promising capabilities of 3D printing, which is about the conductive 3D printing. Um, so people have already explored the multi um, multiple ways to create the conductive traces on 3D printed objects. Like you, as I said, you can, you can use the highly conductive copper tapes and also uh, some capacitive 3D printing materials uh, which can be directly embedded in the 3D printed objects for interaction. And 
Also, we can use some other uh, alternative printing processes to incorporate into the 3D printing objects. So in this case, I have two main research questions. Uh, what applications are possible with the highly conductive 3D printing technology? And what tools can support such a big shift? So we introduced a model lag, uh, a design tool that enables designers to integrate electronic parts with 3D designer designs before fabrication and assembly. And it also can enable the designers to create a 3D circuit layout with 3D printable, highly connective internal chassis. Uh, to understand the characteristics of such a tool for incorporating electronics and 3D printed forms, we conducted a formative study with uh, five people uh, at HP labs, and three of them are mechanical designers and two are uh, electrical engineer, engineers. They all have the uh, positive experience of physical computing. Um, so from the study, we, we, we got some uh, takeaways, which is about like, there is a very strong need for accurate 3D representations of electronic components in such a tool. And also they want to uh, like try to lay out the electronics in the 3D model. And finally, they want the freedom to explore different circuit layout. To do so, the first step is to uh, create a library of 3D representations of components. Uh, so we developed a model like to support three uh, ex existing third-party uh, EDA tools like uh, Freezing, Ego, and uh, Cadence. Uh, we also create a little tool for the user to customize the 3D models for the electronics, and also they can configure the pin information in the tool so that we can actually read the information in our model-like tool. So this is the main interface of the model-like uh, tool. Uh, it is a plugin for Rhino. Uh, in the Rhino editing environment, you can create a custom shape, and then you can uh, create, like in import the provided uh, 3D models of the electronics, and then uh, automatically generate the circuits based on the schematics, and then uh, manipulate all these electronics, the layout in the 3D environment. Let's see the uh, overall workflow of, of this tool. The first of all, the user needs to create a 3D model uh, in the Rhino. And then the user needs to import a schematic of the circuit so that the model can understand what kind of in, uh, electronics can be imported into the model. And then the user also can arrange the, each, of, each individual uh, component in the 3D model. And uh, besides, the user also can add some 3D printed highly uh, conductive pr uh, parts, which will be printed by our uh, 3D printer. And then the user can validate the generated uh, routes uh, of course, the user can actually go back and iterate on this circuit layout and also the traces. Finally, uh, we are going to use the test bed 3D printer at HP, and the 3D printer can support multi-material 3D printing, which includes the plastic and also conductive uh, materials. So here, let's see how this tool works. First of all, we select a schematic. Um, this, is, this schematic uh, is created by Cadence, and you can see all the components are automatically loaded into the model. And also the user can actually select like a custom design uh, battery model here. And then the user can drag, move, rotate this individual uh, component in the model. Also, the user can, if the user wants to directly select one position for a particular electronic, they can use the quick positioning feature to directly select one position and then add that electronic. Yeah, and then the next one is to load the print file profile because uh, the 3D printed uh, conductive part is very 
dependent on the 3D printers, because some, some 3D printers, as you know, uh, some 3D printers cannot print the highly conductive parts. So if you work with uh, different uh, printers, you need to let the two know what kind of the specifications of the conductive parts can be. Uh, in this case, we create a JSON file to specify all these parameters. Then the user needs to load this file first, and then the two will know uh, the, the, the parameters for 3D printable conductivity. Here, uh, the user can validate the traces, which is generated automatically by the tool. Uh, first of all, the tool will generate the right lines, which indicate the connections between the components. That's uh, not the real uh, traces. Once the user uh, config and uh, inf uh, validate all these connections, then uh, the, user, the, the, the tool will generate the traces automatically for the user. As you can see here, the yellow orangey ones are the generated traces. The next one, I'm gonna show you how to iterate on this 3D model and also the electronic layout. Then the, the traces and also the circulator layout will be automatically updated by the, the, the changes. Here I move, I, I move the model a little bit and also change the position of the one LED. Then I generate the, the traces again and the traces will be automatically and correctly generated. Finally, I want to show um, how to add the 3D printable highly co conductive parts. Here we, I'm going to add two uh, touch areas and these are manually added. So user can actually change the size of the touch area and also uh, specify the connections between these areas. And also for the tracing, people can manually add the tra additional trace in addition to the uh, exist existing uh, generated traces. And you can connect the components to a trace or component to a conductive area. Okay, let's talk about the fabrication process. So as I said, I, we are using a MJF-based 3D printing uh, printers at, at HP. That is a test bed, it's not a commercially available. Um, so the process looks like this. So first of all, we lay out one layer of power. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I might run out of time. But actually, uh, these are some uh, details of the implementation and you can refer to our date, uh, paper. I just want to show a few applications powered by this technology. So first of all, we create a fracture-based uh, controller to control the uh, game, pin, pin, pinball game. And here's a storytelling tool, and we One can day, embed actually the circuits inside a very complex so, uh, geometry. Uh, in this case, all the components are at the bottom of the object, and the user can actually touch the very spiky uh, share, share and interact with the prop. Again, we can uh, create a personalized controller. And lastly, we can create an interchangeable uh, gadget for, uh, for, for the user. And in this case, we have a, a, held, a handheld device which can have two different uh, heads. One is for flash lights and the other one is for fan. So in different cases, you can actually interchange those heads and for different purposes. All right, so and also we run a study and I probably will just go through the details quickly. And this is a result. Uh, due to the COVID-19, COVID we can't print all of them, but uh, in, as a result, I think the, 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 the user finds the tool very usable, usable and also uh, we have a lot of interesting fi uh, findings. For example, they like the auto generation of the traces, and that's quite helpful because people don't need to fabricate all these traces uh, uh, and, and test it uh, in the physical world again. And there are a couple of constraints and limitations uh, we mentioned in the paper. And overall, I think we, this technology is very promising, and we've efficient in the future that was the conductive 3D printing measured again, then we can actually uh, deploy this kind of software to accommodate this kind of new trending in 3D printing. And that's all, I think uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much.
Thanks so much, Liang. Mm -hmm. um, we can take questions in the chat as well. If people want to raise their hands on Zoom, we can unmute them. Are there any questions in the lecture hall? Um, are there any limitations of the HP conductive printing process where the resistivity is too high for you to not realize any kind of circuits? Mm -hmm. uh, so at this current stage, the 3D printer is still under development and also is testing. Uh, so, but we got some very positive uh, results on the conductivity. I can show you here. Uh, so for the conductivity, we we actually uh, reached a very low uh, con yeah low resistance like it's about like a one ohm uh, microns that's very very high conductivity and then uh, but we certainly have some energy loss when we deploy very long chains inside the model uh, that's something we want to improve in the future because. Uh, uh, in this internship, I'm not actually working on the electrical engineering part. I'm also just working on the software set side. But uh, the, the team is actually working on towards to provide a very high uh, conductivity for other applications like the antennas. One, one is the very promising area, I think. Yeah, so, uh, and also the, the, the whole setting is very big. It's like a room size printer. It's very uh, cumbersome. And usually one printer will take about like several days. That's also a limitation, I think, at this stage. But uh, in the future, I think it will be much better and much improved. Yeah. Uh, I was curious like, about your auto tracer. Um, could you talk a little bit about how that works and how it would scale to more complicated designs? Because I was thinking about the auto router for PCB design that is always getting like, when you, it becomes unusable once you have like a very complicated design. Yeah, yeah. Could you talk a bit about how you solve for that? Sure, yeah, that's a good question. Um, okay. Yeah, so the question is about uh, uh, more details about the auto routing and the generation of the routes on, in the 3D space and uh, uh, what's the difference between this and also the, the uh, auto uh, generation of the traces on the PCB 2D platform. Uh, I think this is quite interesting because uh, it's a 3D, it's not a 2D anymore. Uh, and uh, right now we are just using a star searching algorithm to generate these traces and for the order wise, we 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 chose the points which are closer each closer to each other as the first uh, as higher priority, and we generate these traces straightly, uh, and then we run the A star searching to generate these uh, traces in the 3D space. But there's some certain limitations as well, because uh, like like a geometry which is very slender, we can't actually have enough space and room for the trace to generate. So that's one. Uh, limitation of the geometry. And the other thing is, like, if two uh, positions that they are all on the same plane, and it might have some problem to detect the, these connections. And because they rely on the follow, follow metric space, and then, uh, yeah, there are certain uh, limitations and constraints here. But I would say it's uh, just a one exploration area, and that is the first step to look into this space. And I think in the future, the 3D trace uh, in the manufacturing uh, field, that might be very, very exciting. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. And we'll actually be switching places right now. I will be our next speaker, um, and Liang will be managing the chat and questions. So hello all, I'm Megan Hoffman. I'm a visiting research chair from Carnegie Mellon University in the last year of my PhD program. Um, and today I want to talk to you about Optimum, a tool for supporting domain experts um, in specific, domain specific generative design with metaheuristic methods. My research is really focused on domain specific design tools, particularly in the space of fabrication. And most of the domain experts I'm looking at are not engineers or technical experts, they're clinicians or they're people with disabilities. They're different people who are bringing in a particular knowledge base and using that to fabricate something for health and accessibility purposes. And there is a lot of related work on creating domain-specific tools for digital fabrication, particularly looking at expanding the ceiling for experts, technical experts, with different types of fabrication processes. And to a lesser extent, work in accessibility in other areas where we're raising the floor for these domain experts who don't necessarily have that technical expertise. Um, looking at things like tactile graphics for blind people or assistive grips for people with motor impairments. 
And one thing many of these have in common is that they are using kind of a generative design framework where we're taking in some user-driven domain-specific goals or objectives, we're running some black box of an optimization process, and out on the other end comes an automatically generated model that meets their needs or goals. Part of the problem is, is that building these tools and particularly these optimization processes can be a little bit tricky. There's a lot of optimization methods to choose from. Each of them have their own criteria and constraints. And usually it takes a team of both technical folks and domain experts with that external knowledge to choose the right method and kind of tailor it to that domain. My goal is to build meta tools for domain specific optimization. The idea being that we could make it a lot easier for domain experts and technical experts to collaborate and build these systems. And when I say meta tools, I mean systems that help us to program and implement other types of systems. Everything from a programming language to an IDE kind of falls in this broad category. But the general idea is that meta tools amplify the expertise of some sets of users. So in end user programming uh, uh, work, we would think of these as programmers using something like a programming language, and then tinkerers, as we would call them, changing the parameters of those programs to create new programs and do interesting things with them. In my space, we're really thinking more broadly about technical experts using meta tools and domain experts using domain specific tools. Meta tools and the tools that they create can support new types of domains, everything from tactile graphics to machine and hand knitting design and 3D printing PPE and splints. And by extension, this means that we're supporting new sets of users, people with disabilities, care and clinical workers, and craftspeople. One of the meta tools in my thesis work is called Optimum, Optimization Programming Toolkit Integrating Metaheuristic Methods and user, or Metaheuristic User-Driven Methods. And we presented the first system built with, with this meta tool at WIST in 2020. Optimum helps domain experts and programmers to collaboratively build generative design tools. It does this with a few abstractions. First, it helps us customize an objective function. It second defines ways of improving designs to meet those objective functions, and then helps us to choose and customize an optimization method that is tailored to that function. And it helps to bring in the expertise from domain experts by really honing in on the concept of a heuristic, a strategy that is likely to improve a specific set of objectives. We can further decompose the concept of a heuristic into objectives, the design goals that you're meeting, and modifiers that make changes to designs, the strategy you're meeting to meet those objectives. Let's look at an example from the work I've done on uh, PPE and fabrication in healthcare. A clinician could come in and tell you some objectives and heuristics about designing a new face shield. One of their goals would be to expand, uh, create more airflow so that their face shield doesn't fog up. And they could tell you that increasing the spacing between their forehead and the shield is going to help you do that. Another goal is for it to fit to different sized heads. And the way you adjust that is by changing the parameter at where it connects with the temples. And then finally, we want to change the compliance, which is going to affect what kind of strap you can use comfortably on the back, which is just going to be changing the parameter at where the two tails meet behind your head. We can compose objectives and the ways of changing the design to meet those objectives into the a heuristic map, which is just a weighted set of objectives from which we get our objective function, which is just the weighted uh, sum of all of the objective scores and modifiers, which are ways of changing the design to meet that need. In this case, changing different parameters of the 3D model, but they could also be more complex than that. Of course, heuristics at best are going to help you approach a local maxima. Often they won't even lead to that. And so we really need to be thinking beyond a, a very simple heuristic hill climbing uh, option. This leads us to meta heuristic optimization, which uses a meta strategy of applying heuristics when searching for high quality designs that meet multiple objectives. It kind of allows you to strategically jump around the space in a more stochastic manner rather than relying on using the same heuristic over and over again. So if we break down meta heuristic strategies into ways of selecting a candidate design at each iteration and ways of modifying that design to create a new one, we can decompose a variety of classic meta heuristic methods, things like simulated annealing, ant colony optimization, and variable neighborhood search. Optimum does this with a pluggable set of design selectors and modifier selectors in an extendable library. So exam for example, we can choose things like the best design that you've discovered or a random design that you've discovered, uh, the furthest design from the one you just looked at, all sorts of things like that. 
And then modifiers can be, modifier selectors can look at the expected improvement based off of a modifier in the heuristic map or a history of improvement when adding that modifier, different things like this. Of course, we want to keep the domain expert in the loop, and they probably don't understand what any of these terms mean. They don't have any technical background. They're not programmers. And so we build a really simple user interface that is accessible through a web GUI that lets you just mix and match them. All of these different selectors are completely compatible with one another, so they can just try them out and see which one's working in the domain. Once they've selected this and they've provided a heuristic map, Optimum runs through a really simple optimization loop. It starts by giving you a set of input designs and then giving them a score based off of the objective function. It then selects a design using the design selector, considers whether or not it wants to accept that design, and then it selects a new modifier and applies that modifier to create a new design. You then cycle around uh, a few thousand iterations or so until you find the design that the person wants or meets some acceptance criteria. I've done a lot of work using Optimum in a variety of different domains, some a little more silly than others. So we've done a lot of work in the space of machine knitting and creating different automatically generated machine knitted objects uh, with different physical properties. We've also looked at creating tactile maps for blind people where we're considering the blind person as the domain expert here and they're able to apply their knowledge of how they navigate the world to create a very tailored map. And then also some silly examples like creating different flavors and textures of chocolate chip cookie, whether or not you want to be cakey or chewy or crispy, and replication of prior work in the 3D printing and fabrication space. I'm happy to chat more, um, and you can contact me at meganh at cs.cmu.edu, or just find me around on campus uh, anytime this quarter. Any questions? Okay, any questions? You mentioned assigning different weights. I think this was in the slide where you had your heuristic map. Mm -hmm. um, how do you decide those weights? Oh, this is a great question. Um, so the question for the folks on the Zoom was, uh, how does a user go about sign assigning those weights? We have a GUI for this, uh, so that's the first step is that the designer can just kind of choose from this. Um, but the other part is, is that we can also generate heuristic maps from sample designs. So you can just score samples uh, using a variety of objectives, and then we have a simple learning process to figure out what the weighting is between them. In one of our studies of a few of these domains, we actually found that the expert set um, uh, weights were equivalent to the weights that were set with the learning process. It's just the learning process takes a long time to run. You know, it takes like 30 minutes on my machine. Um, and maybe someone doesn't want to sit through that every time they're you know, changing up the optimization algorithm and things like that. So we try to let people choose, and then they can also use this tuning process to automatically do it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Jasper. Um, this is a really cool talk. Uh, so it's, it's interesting like, to view kind of this whole like, creating the um, domain-specific tools kind of an optimization problem. I'm kind of thinking with the example of like the um, the face mask holder, like I guess um, like maybe a mechanical engineer might view it more as like rather than optimize it's it's like kind of a different thought process. So like for the, the example of fit, they might they might design like a flexure mechanism and kind of eliminate that objective rather than seeing it as like an objective um, in an optimization problem. I was curious if you've kind of thought about these like. Uh, ways to kind of like what gets to be considered an objective versus like what do we leave as kind of um, something that can vary or be free or yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it totally does. So the kind of to summarize that question, you know, if we look at something like a face shield, maybe a, a mechanical engineer would go in and design it so that it's always flexible and you're just not really needing optimization or generative design. Um, to which I say, I think the two of them exist in separate spaces. We really see um, generative design kind of shining in places where you have some kind of sets of parameters that you want to tune that are particularly like creating different constructs or, or different conflicts between each other and, and going through the process of figuring each of them out can be very tedious or difficult. Um, I've done a lot of work on splint design with occupational therapists who would probably just get very frustrated. They usually use the same pattern over and over again and then they're adjusting the parameters to a particular person's body and measurements. Um, and that process could be automated. They have some very specific ideas about you know, where the fit matters the most and where you have different conflicting measurements, which one you choose to go base off of. Uh, and so that's a lot of the space where we're getting this inspiration from. But I think there's also you know, plenty of room for creating the 
one size fits all design that has some flexibility built into the mechanical properties as well as the, the tool that lets you build them. Uh, yeah, I was just curious, um, you know, in these kinds of studies and investigations, if there was anything that, like, speaking personally, if there's anything that caught you by surprise that was a really particularly interesting finding? Oh, um, yeah, I've been working on this work for so long that it's kind of hard to come up with the, you know, the interesting ones that, um, that shocked me the most. But I think it was, um, you know, I think I, I really went into this early trying to find like the right optimization method for a variety of design spaces we were looking at, one that would find you the optimum design all the time or would work really quickly. And what we ended up finding out is that, you know, metaheuristic optimization is not usually going to be globally optimum or that fast, but it was good enough for most of users, right? It got you to the design within a few minutes or within a few cycles, and then it would uh, the design almost always met enough of the criteria that the person was satisfied with the result. And so just kind of thinking about optimization as a, as a means to getting there rather than as something that we really need to tune and perfect um, was a different approach for me to take. So I was wondering the so-called optimum design, the end result of this method, is it dictated by the domain expert or is it dictated by the method itself? Like do you show them like the results of a thousand cycles are like, is this good? And they confirm it or deny it? Um, you, it is, is dictated by the objective function they've decided. So it will give you the best result after the number of cycles you've gone through or it will stop at some threshold criteria. We are looking into um, building into the system some more mixed initiative methods where someone, you know, takes a, you know, every, every thousand cycles or something, it says like, here's like a smattering of like good results we found. What do you think? It'll help us readjust these. And there's been some prior work on kind of creating those methods and then adjusting objective functions on the fly so that you're like, oh, it's actually not, you know, the objectives you gave me are not actually matching what you say is the best design. Maybe we need to tweak these a little bit. Um, so that's a, that's a kind of an extra space of allowing people to adjust this without just setting the weights a priori. Do you have any examples of how a structure might change as the cycles go on? Like, do you have like a picture of, say, like the face shield structure at like 100 cycles versus 1,000? We, we don't for that one. Um, I do have, I, I looked at this early on for some of the knitting work, and you would, there, all of the modifiers are like changing stitches in this kind of grid like graph structure. Um, and so you can kind of see it just kind of naturally like, randomly hops around changing stitches and then they start to coalesce because they're meeting some objective in that region and then it just like bubbles out. But I think for every different, you're gonna have a different kind of representation you're modifying and so it's gonna be very different across different domains. So our next speaker is Hannah Twigsmith um, and she's visiting us over from Human Centered Design and Engineering and she's gonna talk to us about plotters on Twitter. Okay, uh, hello everyone, my name is Hannah. Um, I am a PhD student in human-centered design and engineering. Um, I am advised by Nadia Peak, and I work in her lab, Machine Agency. Um, and in Machine Agency, we work to harness the precision of machines for the creativity of individuals. So that's kind of the, the motivation for, for some of this work that I'm going to show you today. Um, so today I'm presenting our recent Kai paper, 2021, um, on Plotter Twitter, which is an online community of drawing machine enthusiasts who share their tools, their tricks, and their hacks for using these machines alongside their final works on Twitter. All right, so plotters are, are very simple, low-cost machines. Uh, they move a drawing implement, often a pen, around a two-dimensional work environment. And generally, they have two axes with an additional servo to raise and lower the pen. Here are some plotters in action. They can be very mesmerizing to watch. Um, and I've spent many hours just like watching these videos. So uh, here are some examples of the art that people have shared on, on Twitter. And if you go onto the hashtag, there's just kind of a never ending stream of this stuff. And it's really fun to just go scroll through. Um, and there's a very large community that shares uh, images like these and, and those videos I showed before uh, under the hashtag Plotter Twitter. Um, I'd just like to note that uh, we received permission from all of the artists to include this work and credit them. Um, and yeah, they do some really cool stuff and you should go follow all of these people. 
So in addition to sharing their final works, uh, folks on Plotter Twitter also share their workflows for engaging with these tools. And what do I mean by workflows? Well, in short, a workflow is the series of steps that someone follows in order to move from intent to final product. The domain of manufacturing and fabrication has a traditional conception of a fabrication workflow. Um, first, you have computer-aided design that moves from a design intent to a digital representation. Uh, then you have computer-aided ma manufacturing in order to convert those that digital representation into machine instructions. And finally, you execute those machine instructions on a machine, a computer numerical control machine, or CNC. Uh, for our research purposes, we term these steps the canonical workflow. And this abstraction has also been widely adopted by HCI fabrication researchers. What we do in this work is show how in non-traditional fabrication contexts such as Plotter Twitter, uh, this abstraction doesn't always reflect the breadth of personal fabrication practice. So that brings us to our research questions. First, how can we conceptualize the space of workflows on Plotter Twitter beyond the canonical workflow? And second, how does work from Plotter Twitter question assumptions of who uses digital fabrication tools and how? So to answer these research questions, we returned to the canonical workflow and asked, does this fit when used to conceptualize plotting workflows? Uh, we used it as a starting point uh, to look at the things happening on Plotter Twitter and identified the ways that it fails to capture the activities we observed. To this end, we conducted a qualitative study of Plotter Twitter. We developed a coding scheme to categorize the workflow steps and the activities that we were observing. And we applied it to tweets that we collected over about six months in 2020 um, using the Twitter streaming API. We discussed these categories in depth in the paper, so I'm not going to go into them right now. But long story short, uh, we saw that Plotter Twitter artists display an incredibly diverse set of workflows for engaging with digital fabrication tools. And these workflows are much more complex and dynamic than the canonical CAD CAM CNC pipeline. I'm gonna walk through some of the themes from our findings. Uh, first, we saw that our artists are constantly navigating the often unclear relationship between digital and material form. Uh, for example, the matching appropriate pens and pencils to different image colors re requires a ton of iteration and testing. This artist was trying to create grayscale plots of uh, pictures of birds that they took. And they found that just pen or pencil weren't giving them the dynamic range that they're looking for. Um, they're in a, out of the box programs for dialing in this relationship. So artists such as this one develop their own ad hoc tools in order to aid in this process. Here, um, they're creating a lot of swatches to test different combinations of pen and pencil. And this exploration also wasn't limited to just pen and pencil. Um, it extended to materials that aren't traditionally thought of as a, plot a, a traditional plotting material um, or tool such as watercolor painting and copper etching. Uh, so both of these require completely rethinking how the machine is going to interact with the material, um, and by extension, the, the machine instructions. So for example, uh, if you are going to paint with a plotter, you need to figure out when to pick up paint and how the plotter is going to move in order to lay down that paint in a way that you expect, in a way that's not going to mess up the paper by putting too much water in one area, for example. The next theme we saw was that niche workflows are actually the norm on Plotter Twitter. Uh, we were surprised by just how many niches people shared and how specific that they could be. This is a really great example that I, I love to show because it's so cool. Uh, there's a, there is an artist who made a custom pipeline specifically for designing and plotting Magic the Gathering cards, um, which is just something that is so unique that I, I never would have expected it. Um, another one in the same vein was where someone was trying to simulate embroidery before they had access to an embroidery machine, and they were actually plotting individual embroidery stitches on fabric uh, in order to see that if their design would look once they actually have access to the machine. So 
what this really shows us is that on Plotter Twitter, the workflow itself has become a medium of exploration and creation. Uh, and finally, despite plotters being exceptionally good at drawing vector graphics, we saw almost no use of traditional vector graphics programs, which was another uh, surprising finding. Uh, uh, I'm talking about vector graphics programs such as Adobe Illustrator, which is normally how you would create an SVG uh, to be plotted. Uh, instead, these artists are overwhelmingly preferring lightweight and flexible tools instead of traditional CAD. They would often create their own programs to generate these graphics and then string these tools together into a unique pipeline. They would almost always share the source code for these tools or links to the hosted versions so that they could be reused by the community. All of this goes to say that Plotter Twitter shows that post-anthropocentric fabrication practice is thriving, which left us skeptical of relying on the canonical workflow to drive fabrication research. Um, we call on HCI researchers to adopt a post-anthropocentric view of making, and we call on them to do this by conceptualizing personal fabrication as more than a series of steps. Um, it is fundamentally more complex than that. So reducing the complexity of a fabrication workflow to the vision where data becomes things could leave out the nuanced interaction between humans and their experience, machine idiosyncrasies, material properties, and code, Abstracting a workflow to one where a human maintains seamless control over their tools is ultimately not how personal fabrication works in practice. All of this leads us to an important concession. As tool makers and tool builders, we should not assume that we can predict how people will use digital fabrication technology, especially when they are exploring niche areas and developing novel workflows. Instead, we should leave room for, and perhaps even encourage, unique interpretations of these tools. So finally, as HCI researchers, this takes the form of studying practitioners, developing flexible tools, and perhaps most importantly, refraining from assumptions about who produces and how. And with that, uh, I would like to thank all of the Plotter Twitter community members who agreed to share their work for this paper, and everyone here for their attention. Um, and I will take questions. We've got a question in the chat from um, Josh Smith. Oh, Josh is raising his hand. So how about we have him unmute and ask himself? Sure, thanks. Yeah, this was a really cool talk. I appreciate it. Um, I'm curious, so it sounds like the software people are using is mostly custom. I was wondering about the plotters themselves, how often typically on plotter Twitter are people using a commercially available plotter versus some specially made kind of homemade homebrew plotter? Yeah, I don't have hard numbers for that, but I can say that from, uh, I've been observing this community for about three years um, and I'm also a member of the Discord, which is, it has about 1200 people in it at, at this current point. Um, I, the vast majority use commercially available plotters and of those, I think the most popular one is the AxiDraw, which is created by Evil Mad Scientist Labs, um, who is, they are very active on Twitter and engage with the hashtag and also share a lot of the work that the community has created. And they're, they're very much like a huge part of the community. And I think that's why that particular one is so popular. Um, we also see the make block is very popular. And uh, there are a number of open source designs that people, we also see people building themselves, but probably, I don't know, I'll just throw out 80% are like, are, are off the shelf plotters and the rest are uh, either designs that they find online and build or completely custom, but that's, that's the minority. Great, thank you. This, uh, what would I say, it rang very true to me thinking about 3D printing as well for a lot of similar reasons. Do you think that this is an argument for, um, I suppose, increasing tool, and when I say tool, I mean both programs and uh, you know, physical fabrication machines like, like the plotters. It's, it, would you say that it's sort of um, leaning towards simple and modifiable in general, or is there 
sorry, based on what you just said, the previous statement about what, what researchers should be thinking about, that there is a inclination towards simple and flexible tools rather than foolproof tools, if you see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I guess the, the question to rephrase is, uh, is the is the direction moving more in favor of simple and flexible tools versus like all in one end to end tools? Um, I would say that the the people in this community, Plotter Twitter specifically, they definitely gravitate towards the simple and modifiable tools. Um, and a lot of the tools that they shared were often um, little, very simple like web based. Uh, you, often P5JS sketches that they would just share between them and then um, they would have some limited forms of interaction like buttons and sliders, so they were kind of parametric. But those tools did one thing and they did it very well. And you could often take the output of one tool and then pipe it into another. And so we saw, yes, we, to answer your question, we saw much, much more use of the very simple tools than the end-to-end -end ones. Um, I actually like, can't really think of a good example of, of like a large end-to-end -end pipeline that anyone was using or sharing on this, um, on, under this hashtag. But I also, like there, is some, are, there are some caveats there. Like I, I, I do think the nature of um, plotting and like the creative coding and the uh, parametric design community that exists on Twitter already has, uh, is biased towards those simple uh, tools. So I'm not sure how much it'll extend to other domains, but um, yeah. All right, let's take our speaker one last time, and I'm sure if you have any other questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yes. Our next talk is from uh, Daniel Revier, and he'll be talking to us about how programming matter matters. Yes, very, uh, very kitschy kind of uh, title, but uh, so I was told to subtitle it, and so the idea is simplifying metamaterial design. Um, through a paradigmatic shift. And so overall, the goal is going to be for us to kind of understand fabrication coming from a different perspective. So before I really get started, um, I do have a confession. I don't have a CS background. And so what's been really interesting about coming and doing my computer science uh, PhD is that all of these ideas and maybe uh, some of these concepts that are maybe kind of ho-hum to a lot of you, they're really interesting to me. And I mean, I'm talking about things as simple as mathematical proofs of algorithms or right, the difference between a declarative or an imperative language, these kinds of things. I actually, I, I, I really enjoy learning about them. And so that's really inspired me to try to rephrase how we think about fabrication for the design space. So the title is, you know, how Programming matter matters. And so what I wanted to do is just ask a simple question. Well, what, what even is matter? And I know you're all thinking, well, who's this joker up here? Did he even actually present or did he even prepare any slides? Um, and so obviously it's the periodic table. But I also want to rephrase it as uh, my brackets are a little off. But uh, it's kind of the set of all of the elements in, in the universe, right? And so we can start to kind of think of this more of a mathematical structure is really the goal. So what I also wanted to do is extend, well, we have the elements, we have matter, but how does that extend to our everyday life? And so we've relied on physics to a certain extent as a mapping function from matter to uh, what we see in the world. So you can actually kind of think of like chemistry as some sort of overall large mapping structure, mapping function of some infold Cartesian product of the matter, right? We take some tuple of that and then poop, out comes right, uh, the, uh, the molecules. Or for metallurgy, right, we're able to take copper and zinc and make different types of metals, alloys. Um, and bonus points to anyone that can tell me which uh, molecule this is. It's really helpful for research. It's caffeine, that's right. Um, and just extra bonus points if anyone knows what metal this is. It's uh, brass. So. Again, we kind of think of, I lost a couple arrows there. Uh, we kind of think of uh, fabrication in addition to physics as mapping materials to structure. 
So if you have a block of aluminum, it's not gonna do you a whole heck of a lot of good sitting on your desk. However, if you have this fabrication process that takes aluminum into a can, now you have white cloth, right? Doesn't everybody love that? Uh, similarly, you can take a tuple of materials like carbon fiber and an epoxy resin, and you can get a super lightweight, uh, high aerodynamic bike. I think that's really cool. Again, trying to rephrase, uh, reframe this in a different perspective. But that's taking materials into structure. But what I'm really concerned with is kind of taking that same idea, but mapping materials into structured materials. A key example of this, a natural one, is actually cork, right? Where it, the cork itself is composed of little tiny bits of, of cork, and so you're actually able to get some really interesting material properties out of cork. Similarly, you can do this for electromagnetic cloaks. This is one of the most famous examples out there for metamaterials. And then one of my favorite examples ever is actually this really well-architected doorknob where they were able to structure the interior of the, whole uh, of the whole object to where it was able to shear and open and un unlatch, all as one monolithic part that came from printing. So to get to the point, uh, I'm gonna talk about, about two different aspects of my research, and that's stochastic, or what I'm gonna call interpreted material structure, uh, as well as regular, or what I'm also gonna call compiled material structures. So who here has actually 3D printed something and had this happen to them, right? And I, I hope everyone on the chat also raised their hand, right? So, so this is a pain, right? But half of my research is actually dedicated to doing this in a controlled way. So what's really cool here, there's a physical phenomenon known as viscous thread instability, where if you've ever, say, put honey or syrup down on a, on a surface, it kind of coils and loops on itself in a very unpredictable way, the instability part. Depending on how fast you're moving your hand, how high your hand is off the plate, we're able to get different types of coiling phenomenon. Well, because this is physics, we're able to actually do this for a 3D printer. Right? So like I said, I'm doing that rat's nest thing, but in a very controlled way. So by changing the velocity and the height of the printer, we're able to create our own coiling pattern. And the physics actually allows us to simulate the same thing. Now, this is really important because this is a stochastic structure. It's an instability. It's uh, technically metastable, but it is impossible to really predict what it'll look like in the end. So we have this kind of mapping process of viscous thread printing, which is what we're doing. And we're taking in these, um, these parameters for the printing process, the material as well, and we're getting out a structure. But wouldn't it be great, actually, if instead we're able to reverse that and to, to give the desired properties that we want and then get the, the structure that is the goal. Um, and so what we're able to do, half of the other half of this work is dedicated to finding this inverse design space. So currently we're investigating the forward design of the actual simulation printing process, as well as the physical printing process. And conversely, once we have that, we'll, we should be able to kind of give us a inverse design space. Now moving so from a stochastic structure into a regular or compiled, as I like to call it, material structure, uh, we have these kinds of repeated tiling cells. And so what we have here are cells that are allowed to transverse along the dashed lines and only the dashed lines. Uh, by repeating these tilings, we define the movement, def we have the movement definition as well as the symmetry definition. So you can think of this as a static structure that we define up front, and then we take all of this these symmetries and mathematics, and we can compile it to give us a, a structure that varies as we sweep theta, as we are able to rotate the uh, arrow around the space. So the really interesting thing here, though, is that we're able to map from the movement definition and the symmetry into the material design parameter space, and vice versa, because everything is, is not stochastic, is well known and is regulated. And so we're able to take this work backwards already um, as we make a, a framework to get to where not only uh, can a, a advanced user design a lot of the aspects, but anyone should be able to design, including right anybody, including a child, including your grandmother. That is actually the largest part of my goal is like everyone here, I think enhancing accessibility of fabrication, allowing us, uh, allowing anyone to um, unlock the ability of creating these advanced types of materials. So I'll take any questions now.
Yes. So, I had a question. Um, you've been working with the tilings of those patterns and looking to, in the inverse design space, have your desired mechanical properties and get the structure out. Are you looking to do it only for that tile pattern, or would you be able to, once you develop this method, apply it to something like the HSAs that we work with? Yeah, the great question. So the, the, I believe the question was this kind of framework of tiling this pattern, does it apply only to the patterns that we've investigated or is it generalizable? Uh, the, the question is more about the method of going backwards from desired <laughs> properties to a structure. Um, like if you're able to do it for this tiled pattern, are you able to do it for something like that hand and as well? It's like, oh, if I'm looking yeah. at this mechanical properties, could I put it like pop out an HSA with, you know. Yeah, so, so uh, for, for, for reference, so he's, he's asking about a specific structure from our lab. Um, this is a structure that is able to extend as you rotate it. It's very uh, novel. Um, the idea is, I believe, again, let's see if I can paraphrase this time, that uh, is this, can we generalize this not just to these types of straight line mechanisms, these types of structures, but more to uh, any type of structure? Um, I would say yes, actually. So all we need to do is we need to be able to define the symmetry as well as the movement pattern, and then it can be generalized for any type of 2D symmetry plane that includes all along a cylinder as well, uh, as well as inside of just a regular plane. All right, and I think we're just about out of time, but um, of course the speakers will hang out for a little while in here for if folks want to ask more questions, yep. and I think we'll let everyone on the Zoom go. Thank you, everyone, for Thanks. great talks, and we look forward to the next colloquium.